Okay, uh, so we had uh, Juan telling us about top quarks, and now uh, it's working. And now we will have uh, Alan uh, from Oxford who will tell us about electroweak and the uh, Higgs boson. So, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, it's traditional to start by thanking the organizers, but when you've just walked up from the Duomo de Florenze or de Firenze and, uh, and, and seen the Italian hills with the, uh, the olive trees, you feel particularly grateful to the organizers. So thank you to the organizers uh, for, uh, for, for hosting us here. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about quantum information uh, measurements one can make on electroweak and Higgs bosons um, we've already heard a bit uh, from Juan Ramon about how one might do it in other systems, including in top quarks. And this is based in part on some of these papers, but also draws a lot on other work, including that done by others in the room, who I'm sure will we'll be talking about it in more detail later on. Where, where did I come to this from? Well, I spent most of my career looking for new particles at colliders, uh, but whilst perusing the pages of physics rev letters at some point, it came to my attention that most physicists are not looking for new particles, yet still think they're doing interesting physics, crizzily enough. And what's more, they're not even pretending to look for new particles. So it occurred to me that it was possibly the case that new physics, interesting physics, and new particles were not necessarily the same things. And it was worth exploring at least what new physics and interesting physics might look like with the particles that we know about already. And clearly, the area of quantum information theory is one of the areas which is, uh, as we've heard from Fabio earlier on, uh, and, 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 uh, and from Marcel, is, is very lively and one which we can give a contribution to. And you know, these are not old problems, but they're interesting problems. Some of the oldest problems are amongst the deepest, and we can say interesting things, experimental things, as Marcel was saying, about some of these really deep problems using the, the, the cutting edge experimental apparatus, apparatus that we have of today. And uh, I would say that you know, th these sorts of questions remain of great interest, not just in physics, but in philosophy of physics as well, and to philosophers too. So we, we care about the answers to these questions. The, my, my gateway drug into this was uh, thinking about Higgs boson decays. One of our graduate students in Oxford was measuring differential distributions from Higgs boson decays and asked in one of our internal meetings, what's the most interesting things I should measure with Higgs boson decays? And I started to ask myself the question, what are the most interesting things one can measure with Higgs boson decays? And of course, a Higgs boson is a scalar. It's the only scalar in the standard model and it's decaying to a pair of vector bosons. So it's a spin zero particle decaying to a, spare, a pair of spin one particles. So it's approximately a maximally entangled spin state. It's approximately a, a Bell state of two, uh, uh, two, two particles. And that, that makes it a very interesting state to try and explore. It's, it's close to being this pure state here, where uh, these plus and, uh, and not to, uh, are the projection of the angular momentum operator, so, so sort of SZ type operator basis. Um, uh, and in the language of uh, quantum information theory, it's, it's approximately a maximally entangled state of two Q trips. Gosh, once, once you get the language about what, you're, about what you're using, it gets a lot easier. Once I, I learned the word Q trip, this whole subject opened up to me much more rapidly than it did before. Okay, so these are, these are uh, if we, look, if we look just at the spin of these systems, then their uh, state vectors live in Hilbert space of dimension nine, and the basis for each Q-trit we could call zero, one, two in a computational basis, or plus, zero, minus in a spin basis. And the, the other insight into how one can go about dealing with these things is that if, um, if, if you're, I can just use a corner, if, if we're trying to work out how to deal with these spin one systems, well, we tend to think of them from, you know, undergraduate quantum mechanics uh, as, a, as a plus state and a zero and a minus state, and then we think about quantum mechanical ladder operators that move us up and down between those states, and of course, that's a perfectly valid way in which one can think about these things. But there's nothing to say that if we're thinking about a Hilbert space of dimension three that we can't think of it in a symmetric way as well. Uh, there's nothing to prevent us from doing so. And the only difference is that there's some operators that move us around in this, inside this space which are different. And really the only thing 
that, you, uh, that, that constrains you is the operators which you're willing to apply to that system. And one of the nice things about the quantum systems that we're dealing with in high energy physics is actually we have the freedom to apply a variety of different operators to our systems, at least when we're talking about the measurement of them. So I'll, I'll come on and, and talk about that later. But so, so, so thinking about it in a symmetric way is actually something that is perfectly valid to do. Okay, but back to this uh, state of two W bosons. Well, if you want to do something interesting with them, you, you need to be able to measure the spin of these particles. And like the top quark, the W boson has got this beautiful property that comes from the weak interaction. The weak interaction is maximally helicity violating because when the W decays, the W plus decays, it only decays to a right-handed positive spin lepton. Uh, and, and the neutrino going the opposite direction has got the spin in the opposite direction. So the charged leptons that are emitted in the rest frame of the W plus are emitted in directions that are very strongly dependent on the spin of the W boson. And this is a very nice feature. In fact, we can say more than that they're very strongly dependent on the spin of the W boson. Because these, uh, it, these, these uh, charged lepton and neutrino have their spin perfectly aligned along their direction, it's equivalent to having a projection operator on that state uh, in, the, in the direction of, of, the, of the charged lepton. So um, the probability density function for a W boson, which has got some spin density matrix given by rho to emit a charged particle in the n hat direction, is given precisely by a projection operator uh, in that n hat direction acting on that state up to a normalization constant. Right? What does that mean? Well, it means that in a very real sense, observing the decay lepton direction is making a measurement of the spin in that direction. And the relationship between the spin direction and the lepton emission direction is given just by Wigner D matrices, exactly the same things that you would use if you were talking about making a measurement. Right? So it, there's, there's a, a mathematical very close relationship. and uh, to, to the extent, the extent to which you are making a measurement in this direction, well, that's that's a very interesting question that I think is worth exploring. But it's it's mathematically equivalent. Okay, so the W boson is particularly nice for this because uh, we see maximal uh, helicity violation in the W boson decay, and so we get effectively a projective of a Neumann quantum measurement of the spin of the W along the axis of the emitted le lepton. Um, the same is true for the top quark. It basically is maximally uh, helicity violating. You get you get a you get a, a you know 0.99 correlation. Um, so it's it's almost exactly projective. The Z boson, inconveniently enough, the Z boson is a mixture of the SU2 and the U1 boson. And so while it's still a spin sensitive decay, it's a it's a less spin sensitive decay. Uh, you still get a, a direction, but it's equivalent to a non-projective quantum measurement. And, people in the quantum information world know how to deal with non-projective quantum measurements. So that's, that can still uh, give you very interesting information about the spin. Now, we, we know that these correlations exist whenever we measure Higgs boson decays. In fact, we use these correlations between the leptons when we discovered the Higgs boson in the first place. The discovery of the Higgs boson it was reliant on the fact there was a small angle between the, the two lepton pair coming from the correlations in order to, to, to select out the events uh, that, that were uh, different from the background. So this, this has been done. We know, we, know that, we know that there's a correlation. But correlation, uh, as, we, as, as we heard from Juan, uh, Juan Roman, is that uh, it, correlation is not the same thing as entanglement. It's not the same, as, same thing as Bell violation. So it's interesting to see how far we can push these sorts of measurements. OK, so to do this, we need some observables and we need some density matrices uh, that we can parameterize in this space. So the, the sort of name of the game, whether you're doing it in W bosons or in TOPS or elsewhere, is to take an ensemble of decays, things that look like this. Um, so you, you get a decay, you reconstruct it, you get an ensemble of decays with particular directions. You then want to perform this quantum state tomography to work out what the density matrix looks like. And then, for example, you might want to ask, well, OK, then do we violate a Bell inequality? We can, we can multiply this by a Bell operator. We can ask other things of this density matrix. We can ask, is it entangled? So we can do a variety of different things. But the, but the key point is getting through this step here, which is getting the density matrix from the observables. There's a nice 
uh, formalism you can use for this. So the, the space of spin density matrices and the, spin, and the space of angular functions are related to one another uh, by uh, a formalism that was put together by Wigner and Weil and Moyle back in the middle of last century. Um, this is more straightforward for qubit states, but it's uh, also possible for qtrit and for larger Hilbert space dimensional states as well. Uh, so there's a set of functions, a mapping that takes you, from, takes you from the space of density matrices to the space of angular functions. And that's the sort of thing that you want if you're looking at, for example, Monte Carlo simulating something where you know the density matrix and you want to work out what the, what the angular distributions look like. And then there's a set of functions that can take you back the other direction. And these are called Wigner P functions that can take you this way. For qubit states, these things are actually the same functions, but in general, Hilbert spaces, uh, they're, they're, they're not the same types of functions and you have to work them out for each. So to go for, from the operator to a function, uh, you can take the operator, squeeze it between some uh, projection operators, and this will give you a function uh, in angle, which, will, uh, which is called this Wigner Q symbol. And to go from, from, the, uh, from the function over uh, observables back to the operator, then you can do an outer, outer product of these things with some function in between. And the, the function that you need to do this is the Wigner P symbol. Okay, so you, you need to be able to map between these spaces. You also need to be able to param parameterize your density matrix. And uh, we heard about the block vector parameterization for qubit states. To do it for qtrit states, well, there's different ways you can do it. Uh, at the bottom, I've put an, an alternative, which is you can use Cartesian tensors. But if you were to say, OK, well, uh, let, let's take the most symmetric uh, representation of my state, then you can ask, well, how do I represent it in a symmetric way? And this, the most symmetric way you can do it is a parameterization that involves some matrices that are permission traceless matrices in n dimensions. And we, we're, we're particle physicists, so we're not scared of finding permission traceless matrices in n dimensions. These are the generalized Gell-Mann matrices. So in two dimensions, these would be, uh, these would be the Pauli matrices. In three dimensions, they're the Gell-Mann matrices. And in higher dimensions, they're, they're the generalized Gell-Mann matrices. So for a single spin or a single uh, particle, you can easily parameterize it in this way. Uh, and these sets of parameters, AI, tell you everything that you need, to, everything you can find out about the spin density matrix of this. So there's eight, of, whereas there's three for the Pauli matrices, there's of course eight uh, for, uh, for the Gell-Mann matrices. So these are the things that you want to work out for a single particle. Now of course, working things out for a single particle is only so interesting because almost everything of interest is in the correlations. So you want to do it for a pair of particles as well. And as we saw for, uh, for Juan earlier on, we can extend this formalized Formalize, uh, formalism to include you know, some, some parameters for system A, some parameters for system B, and some correlated parameters that encode correlations between them. And here, if we're looking at a pair of uh, three-dimensional systems, then there's 8 plus 8 plus 64, 80 real parameters of these all together. So this is a lot of things that you can measure. Um, so just to get a feel for what these look like, you get some... Uh, these, these are what these uh, Wigner Q functions look like for some generalized Gell-Mann functions. They're just um, you know, functions of theta and phi um, that uh, are, are different for each case. So you, these things are easy to calculate. To get back the parameters of the density matrix, well, all you need to do is work out what the appropriate um, Wigner P uh, function is, and then average that, find the classical average of that, uh, and due to you know, the nice way Gell-Mann matrices work in terms of their, uh, their inner product, uh, their trace inner product, then it's, it's basically just the, the, the average of uh, some function that will give you back the AI, some averages of function will give you back the BI, and uh, average correlated function will give you back the CIs, CIJs. So this is a really nice, straightforward way in which you can work out these parameters from classical averages. And by class classical averages, I mean you do it for a lot of different events of your ensemble, and you just find the average of some function. Right? So it's a straightforward thing that one can do. Uh, here's an example uh, that was done not with data, but with MadGraph. Uh, nevertheless, it's, uh, it's a nice result. So you, here, here's what one would expect. Whoa. So, the, no, that's not going to work. 
let's try this. So here is what you would expect for a spin singlet state. So these, are, these parameters should be correlated uh, in this way. So these are the sort of AI, the BI, and the CIJ. And you can see that if you simulate the same thing for a perfect simulation of PP to Higgs WW, it's close to, but not quite, uh, a perfectly, a perfect Bell state of these two. Why not quite a perfect Bell state? Well, the longitudinal and the transverse uh, uh, axes are not quite on the same footing here, and these parameters three and eight are to do uh, with the longitudinal parameters of, of, the, uh, of the W bosons, what the spin parameters look like in the longitudinal direction. So you don't get quite uh, the, 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 uh, the spin singlet behavior, but you get close to it. Um, okay, short interlude, so I can keep you hopefully half awake, or even three quarters awake. Uh, thanks to, to Matthew McCulloch for pointing out this. Matthew McCulloch is uh, one of my, my uh, colleagues from Northern Ireland, as was John Bell. Um, and uh, so he came from this part of the world, uh, characterized by large cranes um, and friendly people. And uh, what the people of Northern Ireland wanted to recognize John Bell for his extraordinary contributions to science. Now, the problem was when they tried to name a street after him in Northern Ireland, they came across this slight problem that you're not allowed to name streets after any person in Northern Ireland due to some mm, political difficulties that we had, mostly in the last century. And so uh, the council didn't allow them to name the street in, uh, in Northern Ireland because, uh, because he was a real person. And that was a bit sad. But it turns out that people are very adaptive. And while you can't name a street after a person, you can name a street after a theorem. So, <laughs> Belfast now has Bell's Theorem Crescent. And if you go to this titanic quarter in Belfast, you can find it there. So I like to think that's a, that's a nice way out of that problem. Okay, end of interlude. Okay, so imagine you want to do something like test a Bell inequality uh, for, uh, for, for these uh, pair systems, these bipartite system of two bosons. How, how would you do it? Well, a, an example of a optimal uh, inequality for a pair of q trits is the CGLMP inequality named after these people. Now you can see that while the the, the optimal inequality for two uh, two qubits was what uh, was uh, discovered in the middle of the last century, this one was already in this century. And it took a while for it to be worked out. Once you start increasing the size of your Hilbert space, things get more complicated quite quickly. Uh, and so this has taken a, a longer to get. But of course, I mean, it's just a linear function of, um, of products of, of, of outcomes in, in the same way. Um, and uh, it's got some mod threes in it in order to make it symmetrical for the three different types of outcomes. So you can define uh, such, uh, such functions and you can work out what their quantum behavior should be and you can work out what their classical behavior would be. And for this particular function, well, in a local realist theory, classically, it should be less than two. In a quantum theory, it can actually go as large as about 2.91. Interestingly enough, for this particular inequality, the maximally entangled state is not the maximally Bell violating state. These are slightly different states, and the maximally entangled state can still get a value of this operator up to about, uh, this expectation value up to about 2.9. It's a bit less, a bit smaller. Another reminder that things are more complicated in higher dimensional Hilbert spaces. Okay, so if you were to know the spin density matrix, then all you would need to do is to calculate uh, the, the, the matrix product of rho and this operator, um, find its expectation value, and then ask yourself the question, is this thing larger than two? And you can, uh, you can uh, write this uh, operator out in various different ways as products of Cartesian operators or product, pro products of, uh, of, of, of uh, Gell-Mann mat matrices or how you, however you wish to do it. Okay, similarly to the top court case, you need, to, you need a, an ensemble to do this with, and it makes sense to define an ensemble uh, in, the basis, uh, uh, in a basis whereby you're looking at the decay directions in the rest frames of the, of the, of the respective particles, um, and then trying to work out how they, uh, how they behave relative to each other. And because you know how to work out rho in terms of angles, and you know what this uh, operator looks like, rather like we were talking about for the tops, you, you, can, you, can, you can fold this all down into just a single observable that you want to be able to measure, 
And this is one of the really, really cute things about working these things through. Analytically, you can work through exactly what it is that you want to be able to measure in terms of, these are just uh, angle cosines in the x, y, and z directions of the, the, w, uh, the leptons in one w frame and the leptons in the other w frame. So here's just a function that if its expectation value is larger than two, would give you Bell violation in this case. So is it, is it violated in data? Well, that's a question we're yet to ask, but we can do it in simulation at least. And again, in the mad graph simulation of this, you expect to find that there's a violation of Bell inequalities in this Higgs to WWDK, uh, which is close to maximal. You can get these values up to about 2.6 or so. So this is, this is large, including the finite width effects and the relativistic effects that are absent from the a simulation that involves the maximally entangled state. So it's not quite maximally entangled, but nearly. Okay, well, we haven't done it yet, but we're working our way towards doing this measurement. And some people in this room and elsewhere have been thinking about how to do this uh, for real, how to do it better. Um, so I've been talking about a really rather idealized case, but uh, how, how would you do it for real or how would you do it better? Well, one of the things is that you can redefine your Bell operators in, uh, in different ways. Uh, uh, Marco and friends in this paper said, well, look, what's, what, what is the maximal number of ways in which you, you could redefine your Bell operator? And uh, they said, well, okay, you can, you, know, you can rotate in SU3 space one of the uh, measurements. You can rotate in SU3 space the other one of the measurements and get out the maximum over all of those uh, different types of measurements. And you can optimize for each of those different things. And if you do that, then you should see uh, the, the value which is the optimal Bell observable, not just the one that you happen to put in that particular frame. And looking at optimal uh, observables for exactly the process that I've been talking about before, Higgs to WW, uh, then they showed that, well, uh, not only do you get uh, very high violation, up to about 2.9 in this case, but they even showed rather nicely that as you increase uh, the, the, the mass of the lighter of the two W bosons, the, the minimum mass of the lighter of two bosons, you get this, this number increasing and increasing and increasing. Well, why should that be so? Well, think about it. In Higgs to WW, at least one of the Ws has to be off its mass shell, right? And as it increases towards its mass shell, uh, then it becomes more real and it becomes uh, more spin one-like and it, can, it decreases its spin zero. Uh, type uh, of behavior, and so, you, so you really see how you go in, in going from virtual towards real particle, uh, you get an increase uh, in the optimized Bell uh, violation, and also an increase in the concurrence, a lower bound on the concurrence for these cases as well. And this reminds you of another reason why this is interesting to do. Um, you know, we're doing, we have the potential here to do quantum information theory on systems that are not just Q-trits, but are also virtual systems, in some cases deeply virtual systems. So we're probing quantum information theory into the, the, the realm, deep into the realm of quantum field theory, rather than just into, into quantum mechanics. And that makes it a really nice and interesting thing to do. Uh, this doesn't have to be restricted to WW. Uh, so in the same paper, uh, these folks have looked at PP to ZZ. So note there's no Higgs in between here. This is continuum production of a pair of Z bosons. Um, so this is more akin to the continuum production of a pair of top quarks that we heard about earlier. And again, there are regions at uh, low angle and high invariant mass of a pair of Zs where you expect to find Bell violation even without the intermediate Higgs boson, just because there's a Feynman diagram that's giving you a very nice entangled pair of states in here. And again, uh, you get a, a, a lower bound of the concurrence, which is larger than zero right across that space. So doing quantum probes with bosons at the LHC is not restricted to those that are start with you know, Higgs bosons and Bell states. You can do it for the continuum as well in a really nice way. But you can do even more than that. Um, some of our friends here have looked at how one would be able to probe into uh, physics beyond the standard model using these types of measurements. Um, I don't know whether this is increasing our ambition or not. You know, at the beginning I said, well, we, you know, one wants to look at physics beyond the standard model, but also uh, that doesn't have to be restricted to new particles. But what's, what's the right way of saying? Even if all you're interested in is looking for new particles, right? 
this is still one of the best ways about going, of, of, of going about doing it, right? So here, you find, they find that uh, for WW and for, uh, for ZZ and for WZ at PP and at EE, making probes of entanglement, this is a lower bound on the concurrence, this is, a, this is looking at the purity, this gives you really quite orthogonal information uh, to these contours which are telling you about uh, differential cross-section measurements. And so you're breaking some of the degeneracy between those things, offering increased sensitivity, uh, increasing, sens increasing sensitivity to physics beyond the standard model, probing these Wilson coefficients, probing into effective field theory, so higher, higher, uh, higher energy physics, in a different way and in a more sensitive way. So, I think this is this is pretty good for those of for explaining to your friends who are particle physicists why they should care about doing this because particle physicists start with a very strong Bayesian prior that they're looking for new particles right so at least you can sell it to them that that's interesting as well even if they're not trying to break or test quantum mechanics or quantum theory and then here's another nice paper that came out quite recently just over the summer uh, uh, Jay and friends looking at how well. The difficulty with the Higgs WW measurement is that both of the Ws, if they decay electronically, have lots of neutrinos in the final state. There's two neutrinos in the final state. It's hard to reconstruct the full momentum. This was easier in the top quark. It's hard because there's extra kinematical constraints. It's harder for WW. Uh, uh, but they had the nice idea of looking at it in this in the semi-leptonic case. You know, one, <coughs> one W decays electronically, the other one decays hadronically. But if you know which is the charm and which is the strange, you've got an equally good spin probe as if you had uh, the leptonic uh, final state. Uh, and of course, you don't have to uh, guess what the directions of these things are because you can see the jets that are associated with both of them. Uh, so with some clever reconstruction, this neutrino weighting reconstruction, and doing some charm tagging, uh, then uh, they suggested that with luminosities that are not too far away from the luminosities that we're seeing at the moment, one could start to see uh, uh, Bell violation significance. Um, th this, is, this is even without the optimized operators. I think this is just uh, with, with the, the basic operator uh, um, in, in a statistically significant manner um, quite soon. So this gives one confidence that there are a multitude of different final states in which one could make these sorts of measurements, entanglement measurements, Bell measurements, and probably all of these other measurements that uh, Juan has been talking about earlier on as well. There's now a growing uh, body of work in this area. I, I don't think I can summarize all of it, um, but uh, some very nice papers um, looking at Higgs to ZZ, uh, laboratory frame tests, anomalous couplings, vector boson scattering, new observables, um, and uh, quantum tomography and general scattering processes by the authors who uh, are listed here and many of whom are in the room as well. So I wouldn't uh, try and summarize all of your work. But I think it does indicate that there's a really rich set of measurements here that experimentalists can make. And uh, I hope we're looking forward to doing that. Okay, so I'm gonna finish in lots of time, um, but uh, that's all right. We can have uh, some, some questions afterwards and some coffee. I'm just gonna summarize by saying, you know, these weak decays, they're a beautiful, quantum probe that one can use. This, sp this quantum spin self-measurement, the fact that these, these, these processes measure themselves is a really nice way of getting at uh, quantum processes. We can, in principle, measure spin density matrices not just of uh, the top quarks, but of more complicated distributions as well. And these processes are ideally suited to doing this, uh, this process, which in most of the rest of the quantum world is thought to be very difficult. In particle physics, it's actually much, potentially much easier. So we can measure entanglement, Bell inequalities. They're there in Higgs boson decays and drill yan processes, and they can give you improved bounds on higher order physics. The, the process of turning the Large Hadron Collider into the world's uh, best machine for measuring foundations of quantum mechanics has started, but it's only just started. Thanks a lot, Alan. Uh, I will start with a short question, and then I will, I will allow myself to, to have a really quick one. So 
When you discuss uh, Higgs boson decay to via WW, and one of the Ws is off shell, of course, um, the way to measure it is basically to measure the, the charge lepton direction after boosting into the, like, the W rest frame, right? Now the question is, how does it work exactly in Higgs to ZZ? In Higgs to CZ, uh, it's effectively the same. So you've got, um, imagine doing it in E plus E minus, mu plus mu minus. So you can measure the lepton, so the, the E plus uh, direction in E plus E minus rest frame and the mu plus direction, the mu plus mu minus rest frame. So those are effectively the Z and the Z star. And you can measure uh, the, the, the angle that comes out in each of those two right. rest frames. It's one of the charged leptons, basically. It's one of the charged leptons. Okay. Um, pick the positive one or the negative one, but you can identify those unambiguously and uh, provided that, well, if you do it in different uh, flavors of leptons, then it's easy to do the, uh, the combinatorics as well. Okay, good. Uh, Juan Antonio. Okay, thanks. In slide 33, you made a comment about uh, the dependence of the of this number on the invariant mass, which is not completely correct, I think. Well, the the scalar degrees of freedom in the off shell W or Z don't contribute because they couple to the momentum or whatever of the the final state leptons, and then since they, since they are massless, then they don't contribute. The, pro, the, the difference is because of the orbital angular momentum. The largest, the mass of the off-shell W, the closer are to being at rest in the Higgs rest frame. So if they are at rest, then orbital angular momentum is zero, and then you have the perfect, I mean, the, 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 the spin singlet, right? Okay, thank you for correcting <laughs> me on that. I appreciate it. Will disappear for two seconds. Excuse me. <laughs> Thanks so much for your talk. Uh, I, again, I have a very amazing question. So you, you made a point about this uh, uh, peculiarity, right, on the Higgs decaying to two vector bosons, where one of the two state has to be off shell, right, and. Uh, it, uh, I mean, from your talk, I, I got that you, you think of this as a, a further opportunity or like a feature of this uh, process. But I'm still, I mean, I'm still puzzled by uh, uh, if, I, if I'm allowed to use uh, really this kind of approach if one particle is off shell. Because I, I, I have a hard time uh, having a, a straight uh, opinion on this. And, you know, one of the other things I, I, I believe, right, is uh, if you go one step farther in the perturbative expansion, right, imagine that you have a loop, for example, then, uh, I mean, then there is no W. I mean, uh, there is no, well, there might be a W over there somewhere, but there is not even a, a straightforward intuition on this process. Why? If one W is on shell, you always have a W at the end, right? I mean, you always have a diagram with a W and then in the K. So, and that we know it dominates because uh, it's long I mean, it's a long leaf particle and then it's on shell and so on. So, uh, how do you think about it? Because I, I'm, I'm still a bit confused there, right, by, by this. I, I would be lying if I said that I thought it was straightforward about how you think about this. I, I think that's true. I mean, we, we, we call, quite often call ourselves particle physicists, which is wrong from the beginning, right? Because everything is in the end fields. And there are often limits that we can take or approximations that we can take in which things behave approximately like particles. And here we're moving away from one of those limits, from one of those approximations, into a region where it's a less true, it, it's, it's, it's become more untrue than it was before. Right? So we, we were already wrong, but we're becoming wronger as we say that. I, I think that's sort of interesting, right? We, we, knew it was a, we knew it was an approximation from the start, and we're starting to break down that approximation. Asking the question, 
what do we obtain from measurements like this is, I think, interesting when you come to exactly what you've asked, which is how do I interpret this in a framework which goes beyond per perturbation theory? I think that's a very interesting question. But I would make the statement that if, if we, if we, uh, it, it is perfectly possible to make these measurements experimentally, yeah. right? So we can yeah. do this. Sure, then, when sure. we, then we go to ask ourselves the question: What does this mean? Yeah, yeah, right. And then right. it becomes a much more right. tricky question to try and address. Right. And I agree, we should. There, there's a lot of interest in how how you might do that. Yeah, we're related. Yeah. I don't know if this is helpful because I'm a stupid experimentalist, but the way I tend to think about this is you're right, it gets a bit confusing when you're even thinking about what these particles are when we're really far off shell. If you care about making a particular measurement, for example, you care about like trying to measure something with spins, what matters more is the, the spin states of the diagrams, right? And in the end, you can have multiple different kinds of diagrams giving you the same kind of spin state in the end. And all you care about is what that ensemble looks like over all the thing, different things you can measure. So even though you can have something crazy off shell that doesn't really look like a W anymore, what really matters is the quantum numbers of the, that, of the states you're trying to measure. And that, then it gets a bit easier in your head, in my opinion. In the end, you just have spin directions being conserved or not conserved in whatever angles you care about. Uh, uh, no, I mean, for, for me, it's more difficult. Uh, one reason is, for example, if you consider Bell inequalities, right? I mean, then, uh, I mean, in my mind, Bell inequalities means there are two objects that fly away and they don't talk to each other because they are casually disconnected, right? And, uh, you know, they, they have their own life and then at the end they do something which is correlated in a free way. I mean, the virtual particle seems very... Um, not, not like this, inter this kind of uh, picture, but okay, yeah. But, but we are, we're absolutely, I mean, as you said in your own talk, we're, we're, we're not going to the direction of making things larger and uh, more human size. We're going in the opposite direction. This is one of the ways one can start from in that direction. Yeah, I just have a small comment on this because I also was, was thinking about this stuff of uh, having one uh, vector boson which is off shell. Maybe Juan Antonio, uh, you have looked into it a bit more and you actually can answer this. Uh, because my doubt is if the particle is off shell, is virtual, is the spin well defined? Because what we measure is the direction of the lepton and then we assume that that's a proxy to the spin. But if the spin is not well defined because the particle is virtual, because maybe there is interference between uh, uh, plus one, zero, and minus one, uh, is this still true? That the, the direction of the lepton is a proxy for the spin? Sorry, I. <laughs> for, for the benefit of those of you, the, the point was that you don't have the Z or the W um, at that point. Uh, asking yourself the question, how do I interpret this yeah, it's as, as it's going forward? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's a, you, the, the way in which you're interpreting the momentum as a, as, as a spin measurement of an object becomes a less true statement under those conditions. I think that's the thing that's bothering you folks. And I think, that's, I think it's right to be concerned about that. So as one goes further in perturbation theory, these become less true statements. For example, now, now we're looking at the decay, right? But if you look, for example, into uh, Higgs production and then decay, right? When when um, there are other diagrams, right, that in interfere with this one, where one, uh, for example, if, if you choose the two Ws on shell in group loop production, you also have the diagram with the Higgs, but you also have the diagram without the Higgs. Uh, which is actually very large and very high variable mass and so on. So the whole picture, uh, even of thinking uh, the, the dominance from the heat in the production, it's, uh, it's tricky, right? Because it's a very... 
Yeah, but the background interferes. It's not like a, a classical background, right? It's a quantum background, right? So. It's, it's possibly worth thinking about the fact that these, these, these statements don't, don't just apply to the case where one particle is off shell. They're, they're general statements that maybe we need to think about more, more broadly as well. And Nate, question? So I'm trying to figure out which is the real advantage of the system with respect to the TT bar. In the end, okay, apart from statistics, I'm wondering if in the end, one day we will be able to measure the Bell inequalities evaluation in these uh, environments. Who will come first? In the, in the sense, here, which is the real advantage that you are making uh, von Neumann projection on quantum states with respect to what you can do in TT bar? I think there's a couple of differences. Mm. Um, I mean, I, the TT bar is an extraordinarily in, interesting case, right? So this mm. is orders of magnitude higher energy than anyone mm. saw it before. So that already makes that an interesting mm. case. Um, here, what's different? Well, measurements of Q-trit systems in anywhere in quantum mechanics are relatively rare. Mm. So the fact that one could do it here, um, they're, they're increasing, but they're, they're, they're definitely not the dominant way of doing things. The measurements have been made in photonic systems, but only relatively recently. So the, these, are, these are somewhat rare things to look at in their own right. So I think that, that makes it interesting. I think actually probing into what happens off shell is an interesting thing in, for, for the reasons that we've been talking about in terms of its interpretation as well. And here there's a very straightforward way to probe into something which is an off-shell uh, state. And we think we know how it's going to behave, um, but interpreting the results is an interesting question. Thanks. Maybe just to add, the Higgs is a pure state, unlike the TT bar, where you have the effects of the kinematics there, and this is why we cut on a, an empty T bar. M modulo what Fabio said earlier on, yeah. So yes, to, to an excellent approximation is a Higgs is a Higgs is a Higgs. Right? Yeah, I wanted to comment on that because experimentally we, we still don't quite know which processes and in which corners of phase space will be able to test the Bell inequalities best, I think, right? We, we say we've written down the optimal inequality, but that's it's optimal in some ways, but it doesn't take into account experimental uncertainties that might be very large when you reconstruct your Ws and might. So experimentally optimal, we, we, we have very few studies at this moment yet. So all these pheno studies that have a statistical uncertainty and little else, I think, need to be complemented by a study where we show that systematics can be controlled, and it, this whole TT bar measurement was was a bit of a struggle, um, because you run into things that you didn't see coming, and they might be less severe in in Higgs or more severe. We don't know, and I, I think we need that level of studies. I think that's right, and of course those studies are ongoing, but they are not concluded yet. I've asked one, but I can ask another one if that's all right. Sorry. It's, a, it's a question more about the, if we've got time, about the, um, again, slightly more experimental bent, although I think it relates to what we were just talking about. So one of the advantages of TT bar is that you have very little background, although still some background, whereas this isn't the case in almost all Higgs analyses. Um, and some of those background processes, the way we deal with it is we subtract these background processes from our data. Some of those will also be will have their own entanglement structure, right? We just, the, one of the main backgrounds takes it over W will be Di boson, or depends on the channel, but Di boson can be one, and we've just talked about how, we've shown how they can still be entangled. Is this a big concern for us, that there's some circular argument here, or that this is a overly large assumption going into things, that we're doing these kind of subtractions? Because again, at higher orders, some of these processes also start to overlap, which causes issues, and it's always been in the back of my mind that is this something we also need to be considering in a bit more detail? It's clearly more of a concern for Higgs decays at Hadron Colliders than it is for top decays at Hadron Colliders. But top still has 10% background and interfer yeah. big interference with single top, for example. It's not yeah. like we're it's, free of it. Yeah, but, yeah, but it's a lot smaller. Um, you know, where where the world to decide to provide us with a high energy E plus E minus machine in which we could cleanly measure these final states, our life would become a lot easier for doing this. Uh, but I think my attitude at the moment would be well, let's hope that happens, but uh, let's see what we can do with the machine that we've got as well. And it's, it's definitely harder. Um, you know, the, I, I think 
you know, we're, we're not, we're never going to be doing the canonical bell measurements where, you know, you say this is plus one or minus one and this is plus one or minus one. We're always going to be doing post-selection. We're always going to be doing background correction. We're going to have to have some assumptions about efficiencies and so on. So I think the best that we can do is at least be clear and open about the assumptions that we make as we improve the way in which we make these measurements. We probably can't do better than that. Follow-up statement, so I don't forget it for the next talk, because I think it's a better question for the next talk, but my, my, the crux of this is I'm wondering if we're introducing an entirely new kind of loophole when we ask about local realism with bell inequalities here, that we might have found some extra way of conspiring to trick ourselves. But it's, it's a question for the next talk, I think, maybe. Okay, so I think we can uh, thank Alan again.